So at what point were you a made man? Did they actually bring you in officially? Okay. I was proposed when I was about 27 years old. Uh, and what happened was soon after there was the split in the family. So I was okay. I was approved at that point, but nothing could happen because the family split apart. So as the war was going on, Jimmy and I, my partner, Jimmy, were doing everything with Greg. We had probably 12 shootouts, uh, probably four or five actual hits. We were at every meeting, every sit down. We were with, with the boss, of the, our acting boss who we put in charge. So there were things just out of tradition that couldn't be done if Jimmy and I weren't straightened out. We couldn't go to these meetings and they couldn't ask us not to be there. So long story short, a message was sent through one of Junior Persico's brothers, Teddy Persico, that uh, Joe T would like to get Jimmy and I brought in. Junior sent a message back, his exact words would get those two guys recognized. So we had a, a big meeting during the war where uh, Joe T was sworn in as our acting boss. Different guys were put in positions. Jojo Russo, let may rest in peace, was uh, the uh, underboss. Other guys were made captains. Greg was officially made a captain at that meeting because once a guy gets straightened out, they have to be put with a captain. And Greg insisted that we stay with him. So we went downstairs. It was the back of the Sheraton uh, in uh, at the Meadowlands in New Jersey. And we had, it was a lackluster ceremony. It wasn't like the movies. It was sitting around a table. Uh, we were private. But it, you know, with AIDS, we had a bypass brick in the finger. Uh, okay. We did burn the saint. Uh, there was actually a napkin that, that got caught on fire too. So it was really a little, you know. But later on, guys were getting straightened out in the can, in, in prison. Uh, guys were getting straightened out over the phone. So it it got weakened. That's why I talk about it and I almost joke about it. It's it's not what it probably once was. But we left that meeting officially good fellas. We were introduced uh, and we were directly put with Greg as our captain. So they didn't have to move us. Okay. Now, uh, Michael Franzese, who mm -hmm. I've interviewed a, a yes. few times, he was a captain mm -hmm. uh, in, in the Colombo family as well. Uh, did you know him? I did not. He was before my time. Uh, believe it or not, I met his father. One of the few occasions he's been out of prison. Uh, and I knew of Michael. I knew of him. I knew his conquests. I knew the money he made. Uh, and I, you know, but I'd love to meet him. I, I would love to meet him. I, I, I understand he's really uh, become a different person now. And I, I don't know really if he's, if it's true that he's a, a minister and all of that, but uh, God bless him if he is. Uh, now, I also just interviewed uh, Frank DiMatteo. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was part of the Colombo family with, with the Gallows. That, yeah. Uh, did you interact with him at all? You know, I know the name, and I'm not 100% sure, because there's a few DiMatteos. There's a Mikey DiMatteo that I know, uh, and some pronounce it DiMatteo. Uh, but Mikey was Mike mm -hmm. DiMatteo. Uh, I, I don't really know for sure, to be honest with you. So... You, you're rolling with Greg, and he has this really kind of crazy lifestyle with three wives, yep. and you know he's he's a captain in the mafia and so forth. Uh, and then in 1986, he becomes HIV positive. Mm -hmm. Yes. Talk about that whole situation. Okay. Greg was like a, a swashbuckling type of person. He lived with his own rules, his own laws, no ethics, even in the family, just did things the way he wanted. And he liked to live. So we would have drinks at night. None of us were overboard. None of us were drunks. I mean, we'd have two or three, have dinner with a bottle of wine, but he would like to go to the bar every night and have his scotch on the rocks or vodka martini. And whatever he drank, we drank. So I didn't even have to think about it. But he would take three Anisons Without water, he just popped the Anisons in his mouth. Aspirin, Anison, I guess it's similar. And he did this every day since he was in his 20s because he didn't want to get a headache. He didn't take them if he had a headache. He took them to prevent the headache. What happened over all these years, those aspirins were digging holes in his stomach, ulcerated his stomach. And 
it came on pretty sudden that he had, the, they all burst at the same time. So he gets these bleeding ulcers and he gets rushed to the hospital. I get the call that he's in there. And after two or three operations, his whole inside start bleeding again. Wind up is the surgeon had left one of the arteries hanging. So he's close to death. He needs blood. So they call in all his friends and family. The hospital wanted to give him their blood because it was screened already. And this is early on in age. It's just, this whole HIV thing was new. Pretty much like today with the coronavirus. It's still, you don't know. So he insists, laying there half dead, that one of his men give him the blood. And his thinking was, he knew none of his men were gay. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that, but he preferred, knowing that was at that time, the possibility of where it was coming from. Uh, and he knew that it would be, in his head, his best shot, being fearful of the disease. So about 30, 30 of us show up. Everybody gives blood. There's one match, and it's one of his guys, Paulie. Paulie was a handsome guy, had more girls. Uh, I, Buddy was a weightlifter, and we found out later on he used steroids back in the day, and they shared needles. So the one out of 30 was Paulie, and he matched. So he gave his HIV-tainted blood to Greg, and Greg became HIV positive. Okay. Did anyone know that at the time? At first, no. They kept it themselves. After he got home from the hospital, and I was with him every single day, every day helping him, nursing him along, along with Linda. And one day he calls me in, and him and Linda are sitting at the table. And they sit me down, and the first thing he tells me is, I want you to know you have absolutely nothing to worry about. He says, something happened to him when I was in the hospital. And that's where it came from. Because he was, I didn't know what he was talking about. And he told me that he was infected with HIV while he was in the hospital. Bad blood. I remember crying, feeling so bad for him. And, you know, there was a strange closeness there, too, because I remember him telling me, you know, I told his oldest kids he said, you're the only one that cried. <laughs> I mean, that's a little peculiar to me to this day. But, you know, he I was supposed to be like a son to him. So it was it was it was very it was bad news. And I and I, I felt horrible for him. But that's, you know, to get to the point, that's where he he got the uh AIDS and uh ultimately it took his life, but he lasted a lot longer than they thought because he made it through the whole war and uh which we're getting to and uh uh, into prison. Even, you know, he lasted in prison longer than they thought. 